Um, I am looking at the attendees here, and I believe that we have a quorum. Can you confirm that, Jeff? Yes, I was just going through headcount, and we do have a quorum. I also just hit the record button before I forgot. So we are recording tonight. And yes, I think I count five commissioners. Excellent. Well, thank you all so much. Um, I'd like to call this meeting to order. It's 4.03 p.m. And uh, I'm Julie Lee, chair of the Transportation Commission. And uh, I'd like to go through a, a quick roll call here. And um, starting with um, Vice Chair Parks, present. Hi. Yes. <laughs> all right. We've got uh, Bob Kuhn. Here. All right. Brian Burton. Yes, ma'am. Right. Uh, Derek Spice. He sent me an email, said he was on top of the ski hill doing something. He tried to join us a little bit later. Um, Kate Morley. Present. All right. And Nick Kraft. Here. Excellent. Well, thank you. Welcome. And this is a very special meeting because with us this afternoon, this evening, we have representatives from the pedestrian and advisory pedestrian advisory committee and bicycle advisory committee. And um, so I would like to go through and um, recognize those individuals. Let's start with the um, pedestrian advisory committee. So let's see, we've got Jody, Jody Norris. Yeah. Welcome, Jody. Thank you for being here. Also, also Jack Welch is here from the Pedestrian Advisory Committee. Oh, we've that's right. A, we've got a high tech solution here. I've got him uh, patched in uh, via phone. He, he just concluded one of his, uh, leading one of his walks in Antarctica. So we've got him from his hut by satellite phone. Jack, you want to say hi? <laughs> <laughs> you there, Jack? I'm here. All right. Do we have any others present from the pedestrian advisory committee? I just see initials, so it's hard for me to pick people out. Okay. All right, let's talk about Bicycle Advisory Committee. I believe I saw Kim Austin on the line. Maybe earlier. I don't, even, I don't see myself. Oh, there I am. Hi. There you are. Yay. Hi, Kim. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you for having me. And Estella. Hi, everyone. Yep, Estella here I'm with the, the Bicycle Advisory Commission. Okay, and others from Bicycle Advisory? Jeff Golden. Hi, Jeff. Okay. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, we also have um, invited Commission on Inclusion and Adaptive Living. Do we have members from that commission with us this evening? If you would please introduce yourselves. Hi, this is Denise Thompson and I'm the staff liaison for both the inclusion and the CODA commission. And I'm looking at the list of attendees and I don't see anyone from either one of my commissions on here. So I don't know if they were gonna make it or not. Okay. Well, thank you for being here, Denise, mm -hmm. this afternoon. Um, I did receive a couple of comments via email, um, so we can address those when the time comes. So although they're not here with us, um, I did receive comments that I can share with the group. Okay, good. All right, so before we move into um, some recognitions I'd like to give, I would like to open it up for public comment. If we have members from the public, um, at this time I'd like to call you um, forward to participate in the um, team's meeting to address anything that is not on tonight's meeting's agenda. Um, if it is on tonight's agenda, we ask that you wait till that item is presented and then we'll give a call for public comment during that time. 
Um, we are in a position, if it's uh, not on tonight's agenda, we are happy to listen to. We're not able to comment at this time, um, but we do welcome you for members of the public like that would like to address the commission for items that are not on the agenda. All right, we will close public comment then. And um, next on the agenda is the, the approval of minutes, but I do not believe that we have seen those unless I'm mistaken. So I'd like to hold that until December if that's possible. Yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. So I would like to move on to new business and it is the only agenda item for tonight, which is the active transportation master plan. And this is very exciting. And I would like to, to recognize the individuals that have done so much work to bring this forward. And I would like to start with the pedestrian and bicycle advisory committees. And this has been a work in progress for six years. Um, and a huge amount of effort and time and thought and care has been put into it by these committees and by city staff. And um, and we just want to recognize you. So those individuals on the pedestrian advisory committee, some of them are here this afternoon and you've seen their faces, but Brandon Crookshank, Matt McGrath, Jody Norris, Zach Schwartz, Jack Welch, and the newest member, Shay Zimmer. And on the bicycle advisory committee, we have Mark Howitt, Kim Austin, Daniel Krim, Jeff Goulden, Estella Hollander, Susan Hefley and Matthew Mitchell. I want to thank you for all of your hard work. I, in reviewing this document, um, I was inspired about what Flagstaff can be and can become, and that we can be the champions to do that. And Martin Ince is our leader in championing those efforts for active transportation. And Martin, we all owe you a round of applause so in this virtual world, round of applause for all the work that you have done. Thank you. And I am so excited to, yep, nice, Kevin. <laughs> I'm so excited to hear from you and have this great discussion. So the way, way we would like to, yep, yay. <laughs> and, and I know help from Jeff and, and Stephanie and, and other city staff as well. Um, and so the way I would like to um, to do this this afternoon, Martin has a presentation ready and um, the way that this will flow is we'd like to have we'll stop for discussion as needed during his presentation. He's going to walk us through the outline, the key points and some of the um, I guess critical pieces that we'd like to discuss. So we'll stop at those times and move through. We don't need to wait until the end of the presentation to then have discussion. Um, so with that, Martin, I would like to turn it over to you and I am going to turn off my video and mute. And if you all wouldn't mind doing the same, that would be great. Thank you. Madam, Madam Chair, thank you. Uh, of course, we need to start with the with the question. Can everybody see the screen? Is it is it full screen? Is it visible? Yes, it is. Thank you, Martin. Okay. So I think I think uh, your last uh, commission transportation commission meeting was was in October, and we gave you kind of a kind of a taste of what was included in the in the active transportation plan at that at that point, kind of at a, at a real general level. Uh, in advance of this meeting, of course, you were, you were sent an actual copy of the document so you can kind of read for yourself uh, what's in it. What we thought we would do tonight is, is to go through it in uh, somewhat more detail to give you an idea of, of what's in it, uh, how it reads, and what our intention is or, or what, what we're trying to do with, with some of these sections and then uh, hopefully you can you can respond to that and tell us if 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 we're if we're on or if, or if we're going to missing or if we need to adjust things to accomplish our accomplish our purpose. Uh, we, we were talking earlier, and I'm I'm not always 
great at leaving, uh, creating space in, in these presentations for uh, open discussion. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to be mindful of that uh, today and um, maybe leave some gaps in my presentation. So if you, and, and I hope uh, this doesn't have to be very formal. I hope we can have it more like a discussion. So if, if something uh, occurs to you or you have questions or comments in, in the midst of it, I, I hope you just um, you know raise your hand or or enter something in in the comment box or or just um, uh, speak up and and make that point uh, or that comment or or ask that question, and then I would encourage others to have discussions uh, as well. At the at the very end of the presentation, we'll we'll talk about some of the next steps, and I, I think part of that discussion uh, will be. Uh, how you, the Transportation Commission, wants to uh, engage in this in this plan moving forward. We've got we've got a couple of opportunities in a in a few months to to do that, but we want to give you uh, all all of the all the possibility and all, all the time you want uh, to have discussion about it and to uh, time to review it and to ask questions uh, and to engage in conversation. So I'll, I'll pause there before I get started on the presentation it, it itself and, and see if you have any um, questions or comments. Thanks, Martin. And, and um, I support having an open and uh, more informal dialogue since we are looking at this as a work session. Um, I think it would be good when we do start, when we do make that pause, um, and go into discussion if people could just let me know on the comments on the right hand side that way we're not stepping on each other's toes um, but feel free to unmute yourself if there's something that catches your eye during the presentation you'd like for us to stop and and you have a question or, or have a comment about it does that sound good okay well um we'll plow forward uh, as we presented last time, the Active Transportation Master Plan is, is simply a plan that is a detailed guide to enhancing walking and biking in Flagstaff. Uh, but in, in reality, it's not quite that simple. Um, we also use, the, use this plan to kind of consider walking and biking in, in the larger context of how we go about doing transportation planning and yet land use planning in Flagstaff and, and how those things can help or conversely hurt walking and, and biking. So it, it takes a fairly broad uh, approach. Uh, as a result, it's, a, it's 149 pages and it, and it raises some questions uh, that the city really needs to, to work through as, as we move forward uh, in, in our growth and, and development and evolution as a city. And some of them are, are frankly, some fairly uncomfortable questions about um, how we accommodate cars in the future on our roadways and in parking lots, but it seems like maybe a good time uh, or at least an opportune time to start having those conversation, conversations and addressing those issues. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background, there's, there's a number of things that are kind of converging at this moment in time. And uh, I originally wrote forces at play, but then I realized that forces at work also kind of works. And I'm not sure what if, if it's both or if you can use either or if it depends on the context. So anyway, these are the forces that are at play or work uh, that, that are kind of lurking in the background. Uh, number one is, is that recently we have come into 20 years of funding for ped and bike improvements. Uh, so we have a, an absolutely great opportunity to actually make things happen. Uh, those of us who live in the planning world know that most of the time that we do plans uh, we have no money identified for implementation once it's done. So we have a great luxury here uh, of a good pot of money to actually start doing things and building things. Uh, the second is the city's climate emergency declaration. And I, I don't think you've had a presentation on that yet, but I, I think that might be upcoming from the city's sustainability. Uh, so transportation plays a, a big role in our climate plan. It, it's a significant source of greenhouse gases. Uh, and it's going to it's going to play a critical role in helping Flagstaff meet its its climate goals in the future. Uh, third is there, there's always been a strong community interest in walking and biking. Uh, fourth is that as as we evolve uh, from really uh, Flagstaff being a small town to a small city, 
Uh, these issues become more pressing. Uh, some of the some of the things that, that I talked about earlier that we really need to address at a policy level become more pressing, uh, and we have tougher questions and, and harder decisions to make. Uh, fifth, there are uh, larger global technology trends uh, that that uh, suggest that cars may be less important in the future than they are today. Uh, this includes anything from uh, some of the technology like uh, the sharing economy, ride hailing, uh, car sharing, that sort of thing. Uh, to some of the advancements that we've seen in, in micromobility. And all of it suggests that we may get around and transportation may be organized differently in the future than, we, than it is today. Uh, the next one is our national trends that embrace walking and biking. Uh, Flagstaff has always been kind of on the forefront of, of this movement. Uh, almost every community in, in America is, is tackling this and wants to move it forward. So there's really uh, a very strong push. And then finally, we could we could have a presentation without talking about the pandemic. Um, you know, as, as awful as it's been in in some cases, uh, it has given us a better appreciation for the time we can spend outdoors, and it has kind of introduced a new relationship with uh, our work commute and how we work. And a lot of us are working from home and don't have a commute anymore, or have much less of a commute. And even as as we uh, are able to tackle the pandemic and it, and it kind of fades into the into the background, uh, hopefully it's at some point in the future. I, I think some of these trends that uh, it, it has brought along will, will remain with us. And I, I think we ought to be cognizant of that and see how we can use that to make uh, Flagstaff better. A couple of caveats on, on, the, on the plan itself. Uh, this is uh, most definitely, most clearly a work in progress. Uh, we have not even really been through a thorough internal review with uh, other staff members. So you're, you, the Transportation Commission, and previously Bike Advisory and Pet Advisory are kind of getting in on the, on the ground floor and have, have a, a sneak peek at uh, what's in it. Uh, we still need public validation. We've uh, engaged the public considerably uh, for the last couple of years, but we still need uh, for them to tell us that we've got it right or that we kind of missed it or that we need to make adjustments. And then as, as you saw from the document, there's all, all kinds of missing formatting, uh, incomplete sentences, uh, graphics, photos, and maps, but we'll, we'll work on uh, getting those things together into a, into a more complete document. Uh, but it, it's helpful and, and important to talk about the, uh, some of the text part of it and, and Martin, what, what the ideas are. And Martin, can you talk a little bit about um, what you've been thinking about or perhaps talk to with BAC and PAC about regarding public validation, what that process may look like um, for receiving input from the larger Flagstaff community? Sure, so we've, we've got uh, a mandatory 60-day public review process that uh, will be coming up either um, later this year or early next year. And during that process, the, the, the plan is available to the public and they have an opportunity to comment on it. Uh, we'd like to have some kind of a survey uh, out to the public in conjunction with it so they can answer some questions directly. Haven't, we haven't uh, talked about or worked on what that survey might include, but, but um, I think some of the questions could be fairly general and, and relate to things like did, you know, we these are, these are the things we heard from the community. These are the things we're recommending. Um, did we get it right or do we need to make adjustments? Or is, is something missing? Is there something uh, that we have in there not need to be there? Um, and then I'd like to, the other thing we might ask them about is, is their priorities? There's, there's a lot of stuff for us to do, no question, but what are the most important things for us to do? We think we've got some sense of that from the, the dialogue we've had with the, with the public so far, but I'd like to get them to, to weigh in on it one last time to make sure that we know what's, what's most important for them. Uh, other, other parts of it might include uh, reaching out to some organizations that are stakeholders or have an interest in this process and, and seeing if they want to uh, have something specific for their group. Uh, typically, we would do open houses and public meetings in conjunction with this. Uh, given that that there's not really um, anything, uh, any meetings in person on the on the near horizon, we'll probably do these via uh, this format, uh, or maybe Zooms or Zoom or another format uh, where it's virtual. 
um, in, in a sense that, that helps uh, open things up a little bit because they're, uh, a team's meeting is a, is a lot less complicated logistically to organize and we might be able to have them uh, more often and maybe more informally than we would um, open house. Uh, you know, we're ignoring the presence of a digital divide for the moment, but it's it's sort of where we are in 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 time, and I don't know what can uh, what can be done about about that. Yeah, and I think um, from you know my fellow commissioners, BAC, PAC, um, and Inclusion Adaptive Living Com Commission. Uh, you know, if we have ideas or thoughts or ways, you know, in our community that we can get this out there for public comment, um, you know, we need to do the same and use our networks as well. Um, but I would ask everyone here this afternoon, if, if you have ideas or suggestions about getting the word out, um, please share those with Martin moving forward. Yes, and Julie, thank you. That's that's an excellent point that uh, uh, other other stakeholders can really help us get the word out uh, to reach as much of the community as possible. But the more we hear, the better off we'll be. So uh, back to the plan, just to give you a, a real general uh, idea of, of how it's structured. Uh, sections one and two are kind of the background and, and, and set the context for the plan. Sections three, four, five, six, and seven are, are kind of the main portion of it. And they're organized to start from something that's very general and talks about goals and aspirations. And then gets more and more narrow uh, to the point where we're, we're talking about how do we implement things and, and what are we building. Uh, section eight is, is probably about as long as the previous seven sections combined. And it's essentially the, the how-to guidelines uh, for walking and biking stuff from planning to design to construction to operation. And we'll, we'll look at that and well, we won't go into a whole lot of detail with that, but we'll have, um, we'll look at kind of an outline of it at the end of this presentation. So here are the eight sections. Uh, I think we looked at this before. Um, and I'm, I'm going to go through these, but I'm, I'm going to try not to just read the read the slides, but give you a better idea of like, what we're thinking or what our what our intention is for some of these sections and what we hope to accomplish. So the introduction includes a policy context. Uh, we make the case, our guiding principles, and we talk about our approach uh, to planning. Uh, in the in the way of policy context, the biggest one, of course, is the is the regional plan. Um, we're not inventing policies. The policies for transportation are really established in that document. Uh, we are merely adding to them or, or uh, clarifying or making them more detailed. Uh, two other significant things have kind of come up in the, in the way of background policy, one being the climate declaration. Uh, the other being that the council is working on council goals for the year. And I, I think they may be close to, to finishing that, wrapping that process up. Uh, council goals become especially important in the next couple of years because the city is transitioning to uh, performance-based budgeting, which I can't say that I understand uh, completely, but I, but I think that the main idea is that, is that you determine what your budget is based on um, what your goals are and what you need to, to meet those goals. And if anybody can add anything to that process and how that might, um, might benefit what we're working on, uh, feel free to jump in. Kevin, I know you've got a, some experience in uh, government accounting. Maybe you've seen this process before. Uh, Martin, I have, but um, eventually we would go through, you know, we would go through a long planning process and then not implement it. So I, I'm not, I'm no expert at all on it. So I guess the trick always comes down to that last part, which is uh, we've got lots of, Lots of helpful words, but how do you actually make something happen with that? Yeah. yeah. So I'm, I'm making the case, we spell out a number of, of benefits of walking and biking. And I, and I, I think the, the main point here is, is that um, the benefits of walking and biking really go beyond transportation and mobility and start to address a number of other community goals uh, that, that the, the city has had for a long time. And, uh, someone told me once a long time ago that when when you have a solution that starts to meet multiple goals, 
or serve multiple objectives, then and it, it demonstrates that you're really onto something. So I think walking and biking are that thing that um, if we can move that forward, we're really onto something and, and uh, meeting uh, more, more than just enhanced mobility, but all kinds of things that are a benefit to the community. Uh, guiding principles are, are simply a statement of, of what we believe. So example, for example, you can look at the first one that walking are, are, and biking are important to Flagstaff and significant community values. And then, and then in the document itself, it, it kind of goes into a little bit more detail about what that means, but that it, it felt important to, uh, to have kind of a consensus that we all uh, use this as a starting point. These are the things that we believe. Uh, these are the things that, that move us forward. Uh, the approach, uh, these bullet points, I think we talked about a little bit last time, so we won't, we won't get into too much detail here. Uh, suffice it to say that this represents um, something of a new direction for transportation planning in, in Flagstaff. And really, again, uh, kind of the impetus for it are those converging trends that, that we looked at in, in an earlier slide. And the moment is, is kind of a, upon us uh, to look at transportation in a different light, um, see if we can do it in a way that, that um, really enhances mobility uh, for everybody and makes uh, the community better as a result. Uh, section two talks about current conditions. Uh, these are the sections within. Um, on the first one, the status of walking and biking uh, looks at infrastructure, our mode, some data regarding mode share, uh, crash data, uh, comfort in indices, and then national measures like walk score or bike score or uh, bike friendly communities. Uh, suffice it to say in, the, in this section, the, the kind of the, the conclusion is that Flagstaff is good, but probably not great. So how do we get from, from being pretty good or good uh, to being great or outstanding or excellent in, in walking and biking? Community um, feedback to, yes. Um. So I, I think there was, I don't remember what page it was, but there was a brief discussion about a shift, um, a reduction in um, bike travel mode, um, mode share of, of cyclists. And I wondered, I want to make sure I have that correct in what I was reading. You know, we're looking to increase bike and ped trips, of course. Um, but in the last few years, there's been a decreased number of cyclists. Um, it, did, I, did I interpret that correctly, for starters? And then the second piece, if I did, um, what, what are your thoughts as to why we're seeing that? Uh, I, you did interpret that correctly, that if you look at, uh, we have a couple different sources of data that we use for mode share and, and generally they show that that bicycling is is on a slight decline um, over the last 10 or 15 years. Um, I don't know if it's if it's absolute numbers or if it's just the, the percentage of, of trips. So, you know, Flagstaff is growing, so we have more trips. We might have more bike trips, but just a smaller percentage. Um, but it but it does it does appear to be a consistent trend and, and one that we would definitely need to to reverse or get going in the other direction. Uh, as as to why, um, you know that, that might be that might be a good discussion question for the group. Um, one one potential reason is uh, I'll, I'll give two potential reasons. One is that I think we've got a lot of great facilities for biking, uh, but it doesn't really. Uh, hang together as a system. There isn't anything that is, is really obvious um, or, or apparent in, in Flagstaff about uh, our bike lanes and foot trails and things like that. Even though we have, you know, fairly decent percentages and, and uh, lots of good miles, I don't think the system is very well organized into a thing that becomes obvious to people. And then probably the second is that, that many, many communities around the country are introducing kind of higher level facilities that are uh, more separated or protected from traffic. And I, I think we have been uh, kind of slow to uh, implement those types of things. And, and lots, of our, lots of our citizens are, are quite aware of, of you know, what's, what's, what's happening in other communities and, um, and they see that. 
Well, those, those are my two suggestions. And I, I would throw it open to the group to see if there are other, if you have other thoughts about why bicycling might be declining as, as a mode of transport in Flagstaff. Any thoughts, BAC, BAC people? I'm looking at you. I know I put a I put a call out in the chat uh, for anyone from BAC if they were interested in sharing their thoughts and opinions on it. Hi, this is uh, hi, this is Daniel Krim from the BAC, and it's news to me that bicycling is down over the last five years. I didn't know that. Uh, this is Kevin. Um, I have a thought on that, um, it, and it uh, reflects something you just said, Martin. I think what could be happening is that there are many, many, perhaps a trend of new cyclists coming into the community or adopting cycling as a mode of transportation, but because our facilities are generally not separated facilities, then I would think that beginning cyclists, and I kind of remembering when I was one in the Washington DC metro area, would not favor using say roadway shoulders or uh, uh, bike lanes initially. That might be, might, might be part of it. I think we've got a comment question from Susan, then Estella. Susan. Susan, if you're speaking, we can't hear you. Right, well, we sort that out. Um, Estella? Yeah, I, it's nothing, it's more anecdotal, but I'd be curious um, a bit of kind of maybe the growth patterns around the city. Like I'm thinking, you know, like Presidio, a lot like the, some of the new housing developments, you know, they're more on the outskirts of town. Um, and so that just discourages biking because distances are longer. Um, and so that could be a potential reason why maybe the mode share um, is shifting and changing. Kim. Hi, I have a thought. Um, I was thinking that the use of smartphones, um, I feel like uh, the distraction while driving, people might be just scared to be out on their bikes because um, there aren't any protected bike lanes or anything like that. And I mean, you know, it, it, I think it's a problem and people are just scared to try and new bicyclists might not be willing to um, venture out on the roadways, um, maybe just in the forest, you know, where there aren't cars or anything like that. But I think that might play into it possibly. Thanks. And, um, <clears throat> this is Brian. In 03, when I moved here, someone made a comment to me on a Friday night because there were six cars parked at a parking at a stop sign or a, a light, and at that time it was really crowded. And I thought to myself at the time, because I came out of California, you got to be kidding me. Now I feel like I'm back in California on a Friday afternoon or a Friday evening. That is probably pushing the biking to the side because it's just getting too hectic for traffic. He, you know, first thing in the morning, going to work, it's packed. Lunchtime, it's packed. And going home, it's packed. Now, we're trying to get rid of that, obviously. But I think it's affecting biking right now. I had a, Susan's having some difficulty with her audio. Um, and her comment is that she's heard that more large SUVs have discouraged cycling. And her question was, if this trend is in Flagstaff mostly, and I'm assuming that that trend she's referring to is the decline in um, bike mode share. And Martin, do you know the answer to, to that question, if that's primarily? Yeah, I've got my microphone going. Oh, 
thank you, Susan. Please ask your question. <laughs> well, yeah. So I have read someplace that uh, larger vehicles on the road have have uh, intimidated some cyclists. Um, now, Martin, double checking: is this tr a trend that's nationwide? Uh, is it just Flagstaff? And did I hear you say it's in the last ten years? Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know. I think I think generally nationwide uh, things are kind of ticking up, but it probably varies by community by community. And uh, we first started measuring mode share in 2006 when the, uh, at the time FMPO did its first uh, trip diary survey. So they've, they've repeated that survey in 2006, 2012, and 2018. So that, that's kind of the extent of our data. So whatever 2006 is, 14 years ago. Looks like Kim has a, a follow-up comment here. Um, I can read it, Kim, or you can address the group. Oh, go, go ahead. Um, <laughs> Kim's comment, um, I also feel that the influx of NAU students bringing vehicles may have also played a part, um, traffic and distraction. Also, people always seem to be in a hurry, which may also play into more cars and fewer bikes. Good comments and observations. Um, you know, pedestrian um, mode share was has increased. And I don't know if there's any discussion around around that. If anyone would like to have discussion around that, I'll, I'll offer I'll offer one one thought on um, pedestrian mode share. Uh, mode, mode share in Flagstaff is really is really a tale of, of two different cities. Uh, mode share generally in the in the central area is increasing, and I, I think that may may go for bikes as well, uh, but especially pedestrians. But on the in the areas kind of further out from downtown and, and NAU, uh, mode share is decreasing, including walking. So whatever all, all the development that's taking place downtown, it, you know, it's more dense. We're getting more activity. Uh, is promoting people walking and biking. And that, that includes everything that's going on at NAU with the rise in population and, and their uh, student housing in, in proximity to the campus. And then when we get further out, uh, that, that trend kind of, kind of ends uh, and we have a harder time um, attracting people to walking and, and biking. And I, I think that's largely a function of, uh, like Estella said, distances. Uh, and land uses and, and facilities as, as well. Well, thanks for, for taking a break there and having a conversation about that. Um, if there are no other comments or discussion on this item, I think we can move back to the presentation. Before we do, though, I think, Kate, you have a, a comment, overall comment. Yeah, I just wanted to weigh in on some of the big picture items that Martin discussed in relationship to that bike conversation. And one is, I really appreciate under the approach section that this is transformational and not incremental. And I think we're seeing that through bike uh, usage, right? Where we need to really rethink the way we have done that because people aren't as comfortable as they used to be. And we're not only are we trying to meet previous levels, but we want to be better than we ever have been in the past. Um, and then just make the general comment of as you're looking at, you know, making the case for this. Um, I can't I honestly can't think of a better place to spend public dollars to have an impact on so many areas. I mean, we're talking about climate action, health, safety, equity, mobility, you know, general environment, the, uh, there's economic benefits. I just think it's such a place to get a bang for our public dollars as the investment in bike and ped infrastructure. So, thank you. Um, Brian, you've got your hand up. Hand is down. Okay. <laughs> Um, any other any other comments? Otherwise, we can go to the next topic. Okay, so the community feedback section talks about uh, what we've done to date. Uh, just to, to summarize, we've done.
different public surveys, uh, gotten more than 2,000 responses. And we've provided a lot of opportunity to have discussion with the, with the public, uh, almost in kind of a one-on-one -on -one, uh, setting to hear what, what their thoughts are, what their concerns, what, what motivates them, what demotivates them about walking and biking. Uh, and hopefully, you know, we've, we've learned a lot from, from that process, and hopefully it, it is translated accurately into the plan itself. Uh, the next section talks about some of the some of the challenges, and this this may be uh, directly related to the conversation that that we just had. Um, more related to you know infrastructure, but but what what's going on in Flagstaff that that presents challenges that we have to overcome. So there's a short discussion about each one of these in the in the document it, itself. Um, and that leads us, that, that's kind of the, you know, the one side of it. And then we flip to the other side, the positive side. What's the opportunity in Flagstaff? And then you know, here's, here's a, a pretty good list of, of things that really make Flagstaff have a tremendous amount of potential for increasing walking and biking and really makes it a great place that, uh, already for walking and biking. And I won't, I won't go through these in, in detail, although I will highlight one about midway down, the 20 years of funding, again, is a, is a great opportunity uh, for us to actually implement some things. Some, some of these things are really out of our control, like uh, favorable weather at the, <laughs> at the bottom. But we have it, so let's take advantage of it. Uh, section three is vision, policies, and goals. And this is kind of the aspirational uh, part of the, of the document. Uh, goals we talked about last time, there are six, well, there should be six. Somehow one got missing from this list. Uh, chapter four is strategies and actions. They are organized around the six goals. This is another, another long section to plan. Uh, we've identified 65 potential strategies and almost 300 uh, detailed actions, that specific actions that, that we could take. Now, we tried to be as, as um, specific as possible when these strategies were written. So somebody picking up the document, there would be no doubt about what to do. Uh, and so it doesn't, it, it's as unambiguous as, as possible, but uh, that's, a, that's a lot to do. There's plenty of opportunities for us. I've got the six goals here, Martin, and I'll just read them to the group. Um, so building networks for walking and biking that are continuous, attractive, safe, comprehensive, and convenient. Number two, take care of what we have. Yep. Three, cultivate a supportive environment for walking and biking. Four, improve safety for walking and biking through education and enforcement. Five, promote land use and transportation planning that is supportive of walking and biking. And six, which is the check-in, assess how we're doing for walking, biking, and trails. Perfect. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah. Uh, section five uh, is the recommendations for infrastructure uh, divided among these types. A uh, couple of details um, on the, the bikeway section was originally bike lanes. Uh, bike lanes are really pretty straightforward. Either either we have them on streets where we need them or we don't. And then we had a we had a plan for uh, you know, which ones were priorities and which ones ought to be implemented first. And then we identified uh, a sec a, a, some money out of that twenty nine million dollars to help implement them. Um, since then, we've we've broadened the concept to include bikeways. Uh, bikeways more generally are a variety of facilities that might include some uh, higher functioning facilities like protected or separated bike lanes. Um, it addresses intersections and crossings. Um, it's really intended to be low stress. So it, it appeals to as much of the, the population as possible. Um, we've divided it into uh, four classes in a hierarchy from primary, secondary, down to third and fourth. Uh, the hierarchy becomes pretty useful. It, it's, it's, a, it's a way to help people get around town. So if you know if you're on a primary or secondary bikeway, that you can get to destinations um, all over town, whereas the third and fourth level are, are more kind of local access uh, or access to the network. 
And then the other the other component of it is is that it would go with a comprehensive system of of signing and wayfinding. And this is what I I talked about earlier. Uh, that helps the the whole network kind of hang together, uh, makes it more visible, and it's really an opportunity for branding. So people see it even when they're out driving or stopped at a traffic signal, and kind of gain an awareness that it's something that that is here and available for them to use. And that, that encourages people and actually overcomes one of, one of the barriers that people have to cycling. So it's been, it's been beneficial. It's been complicated really to go through the, the process of doing the planning for bikeways. Um, what we are missing uh, for this compared to when it was just bike lanes is we have not done detailed costing and so we haven't included it in the in the 20 year program of projects. They haven't been prioritized in a, in a detailed way. We haven't included it in the 20 years. Um, the reality is that that the things that we're uh, planning as bikeways are generally going to be more expensive than implementing bike lanes. And so we probably don't have as much money, or, or our money's not going to go as as far with bikeways as it did with the old concept of, of bike lanes. So we're, we're kind of put in a situation if we're going to be successful uh, implementing this, that we're gonna have to find an outside source of, of funding. And there, there, are some, there are some possibilities. There, there are some fairly decent, uh, good sized federal grants, for example, that, that might fit the bill. I think um, another challenge, Martin, with bikeways is that there aren't engineering standards for how bikeways need to look or to be designed. I mean, there is some guidance out there on multi-use pathways and trails, but we don't have engineering standards. And I understand the, the process between your regional plan and specific plans and then the actual implementation and the um, engineering codes. Um, but right now, in our engineering standards, we don't even have a template for what a bikeway may look like. Yes, Julie, thank you. That's a really good point, and and I'll I'll add to that that we really we we think that there'll be there'll be good public acceptance of of some of these concepts and some of these facilities, but we really need to validate that with the public and and uh, make sure that it's functional and usable and and beneficial to them. And I, I think. When, you've, when we look back to some of the conversations we've had over the past couple of months at, at bike advisory in, in particular, but also at pedestrian advisory, I, I think what we've what our discussion has focused on is um, how, how do we make this system or this network of these facilities as, as useful as as possible for most of the uh, public who either you know currently rides a bike or may want to ride a bike if, if we gave them better facilities. And, I, and I'll, I'll pause and see if, if anybody from either PED or, or Bike Committee um, ha has any comments on you know, some of the discussion we've had and, and some of our efforts to uh, come up with a, a, good, a good plan for bikeways. Susan had a, a comment, another thought in the chat that I'll, I'll read aloud. Um, and this goes back to um, decrease bike mode share. And uh, the comment is one more possible reason for decreasing cycling relates to gas prices. When they go low, folks drive more. And when the economy is declining, the bike industry tends to grow, but decreases when economy does better. Bike biz is booming. Um, good comment. Thanks, Susan. Uh, Estella. Thank you. Yeah, just one comment kind of related to um, the budget and funding. And I know, I mean, in better facilities like protected bike lanes and um, protected intersections, they are more expensive, but I think it's kind of quality versus quantity. And I think, you know, being able to really, um, yeah, enhance the, um, like, for example, the intersections, just uh, I think we, that's when we'll start to see the mode shift compared to just, you know, striping another white line on a road. I think really here's where we need to make this shift and make more quality services or facilities than just quantity. Thank you.
Susan, <laughs> would you like to? Uh, so we, the separated facilities, I mean, they cost a lot more than just striping. And uh, and that I get, that's kind of what Estella was saying as well. But yet we just don't have that kind of money right now in our budget. Yeah, good, you know, good, good points. Um, I, I think that's gonna that's gonna require us to be pretty pretty careful about how we plan these. Um, and to you know, if, if we have limited funding. Um, we're going to have to make sure that we build the highest priority ones. I, I do think there would be that it would be a, a, a step towards transformation if, if we could get something. Um, so some of these facilities on on the ground, uh, either in the in the way of you know a decent stretch of separated bike lanes, or even a protected intersection, uh, for the public to to see them. I, I think there would there would be a, a good response almost immediately. And I, I think it would have uh, an impact on um, all parts of the community. Really, I, th I think people would feel would feel better about biking in in Flagstaff just on the basis of having some of these facilities in in important locations. Even if we're not able, able to build them everywhere or not able to address all of our issues, I, I think there would be a, a good public reaction to it. Or as Kim says, build it and they will arrive. <laughs> Yep, that was a good comment. Um, Nick has a, a question here about all the foot trails are all foot trails paved and therefore street bike friendly. And I'm actually curious. If, I know there are still some that are, are gravel <clears throat> or aggregate. Um, do you know mileage wise or percentage wise, Martin? Paved? Out of the mm -hmm. out of the out of the 57 miles, about half the miles are paved and about half the miles are aggregate. And and we we know you know depending on on their location uh, that that some foot trails are are used pretty heavily for um, commuting, whereas other foot trails are are used more frequently for recreation. And the, the ones that are used for commuting are are generally paved. Um, we have had a lot of conversation about about the uh, how to make foots uh, kind of a bigger part of of our bikeways I mean, we have we have a lot of them uh, a lot of them are located along busy streets and so uh, already kind of function as as separated facilities for people um, however they, they are often not not ideal as as bikeways um, you know they, they are shared so there are pedestrians and bicyclists on on the trail and in, in places where uh, it's busy there can be potential conflicts uh, sometimes we have just some, you know, awkward uh, alignments and some funky sections in, in the trail that kind of slow people down um, who want to be commuting. Uh, and then there, are, you know, there are a couple of other issues that I think we need to address to really, to really en enhance foot trails as a potential bikeway. Uh, they, they won't always be the answer going forward. Uh, they won't necessarily be our default for uh, an option for getting people off the road, uh, but we have a lot of them, and I, I think it, it would benefit us to see if we can enhance them and, and make them a little bit uh, more amenable to commuter bicyclists, um, while not really sacrificing their, their function as for, for pedestrians as well. Uh, Susan had a, a comment here about sometimes there's trouble finding right of way, for example, Butler Avenue. Um, this is this goes back to the, I believe, the comment about uh, bikeways and the cost of of those facilities. I believe. All right, shall we move on? Yes, uh, moving forward in, in the foot section, we'll, we'll talk about some things um, uh, beyond just the trails themselves. Uh, and that include, includes where trails give people access to the forest or on the perimeter of the city, uh, where it's appropriate to have uh, trailheads uh, and other points of access to the system. Uh, and then I think, I think we wanna talk about uh, open space and greenways in conjunction with the foots, because uh, foots ultimately is, is um, 
used for both transportation and recreation. We tend to plan it kind of as a, as a transportation facility, uh, but they tend to work best when people are having an enjoyable experience. And I, I think having some, some form of open space or greenway along the trail makes all the difference in the, in the world. It doesn't have to be a whole lot, but having something makes it a, a more enjoyable experience and encourages its its use. And it also reinforces the notion that the trails themselves don't necessarily have to be uh, right along roadways. They can separate from roadways and, and uh, function almost as a, as a shortcut to the street system for people. And, and the, generally, the further people uh, are away from roadways, the happier they are as, as pedestrians or bicyclists. Uh, so six is implementation. Um, this is a fairly important section that talks about how we how are we going to get this stuff done uh, to help us organize those 65 strategies and 300 something um, actions. Uh, we've listed uh, a list of the first 10 things. Uh, we'll take a look at these for a moment, uh, but I think this is one of the things that we want to we want to get feedback from the public and, and see what their idea of priorities are to make sure that we're doing them. Uh, that we're starting with the most important things. Uh, these are also fairly fairly general. They're not uh, specific things like, um, you know, put in a crossing at, at such and such intersection or uh, make this bike lane wider or, or whatever it is. These, these are, are fairly uh, general. Um, so I'll, <clears throat> I'll just, I'll go through them quickly. One is to use 419 funding to build up priority projects. Um, we might add one here or make a, a sub um, item to address the bikeway since we have not identified funding for it. Uh, number two is to seek grants and other funding sources. Um, I can report that is underway. We and uh, we, the city and Mount Line, have already applied for two grants for biking and walking facilities to help make our the money that we have go further. Uh, there aren't there aren't a ton of grants out there, uh, but there are a few, and we should do our best to take advantage of them. Uh, number three is develop design guidelines. Uh, four, consider and review our transportation planning processes to make sure that they are uh, beneficial to walking and biking. Five is to review our policies and practices for snow removal and maintenance. Um, six is to look at a new process for uh, closures and detours when those things are inevitable. Uh, what really makes a difference is, is how we're treating pedestrians and bicyclists. Uh, number seven is to update the information and maps we provide to the public. Uh, number eight is to enhance bike parking. Number nine is to enhance uh, safety committee. And this would, this would be established a safety committee. And this would be internal to the city. Uh, the police would be involved. Engineering would be involved. Uh, just to, to uh, regularly review where we have crashes and what mitigations might be. And then number 10 is to adopt a complete streets policy. So again, we'll, we'll ask the public about, about these and, and what else we might add, but uh, I'll throw it out to the, to the group and see, you know, looking at this, at this list, um, what else might be on it? Estella has a, a comment in the sidebar, um, and it's, should we add engineering standards per my comment from earlier? So under number three there, develop design guidelines. Um, and I, I would agree, um, develop design guidelines. Um, it could be, and or look to at, at uh, standards to adopt that would be appropriate for some things that we don't already have standards for, engineering standards. What are your thoughts about that? Are you, are you asking me? I, I <laughs> yes, <laughs> Martin, thank you. <laughs> Yes, I, I think I think part of it would definitely be updating the, the engineering standards and zoning code um, as appropriate. I, I think there's that a lot of design guidelines are going to be are going to be pretty detailed and can have their own life outside of engineering standards, but some of them definitely do need to go in the, in our in our codes and standards. 
So we're going to go in order of Susan, Kate, and then Kevin. So let's start with Susan. Okay, so um, I was always, I used to teach uh, environmental science and we talked a lot about internalizing externalities. I'm, I don't know how familiar that concept is with folks, but it's basically saying that the price of anything should encompass all of its costs, including its environmental costs. And that's where transportation that's directed toward vehicles never gets it straight and you know, it doesn't internalize the cost of carbon and, and uh, urban heating and you know the whole the whole smear of things that go along with transportation. So uh, I guess I, I feel like that should be a guiding principle whenever you're dealing with transportation is how can you internalize those external costs of any particular breed of transportation. Um, and obviously with bikes and peds, it's much lower than it is with cars. And I don't know how the transportation committee could look at what they do in uh, internalizing those externalities, if, if that makes uh, sense for you guys to take on that challenge. I'm done. Good comment, Susan. Um, Kate. Thank you, uh, Susan. Yeah, really interesting comment. I'll have to think about how we take that on um, for a while. Um, I don't have, I support the additions from Estella and Julie, and then I think the top 10 list is really good. You know, I definitely look at the 419 funding and think it's really only getting us a fraction of the way to the projects identified. And on top of that, we're trying to be transformational. So really want to look to try to leverage those grants and other funding sources to make the 419 money go as far as possible. And thanks to the city for you know partnering with us on the couple grants thus far to try to do that. Um, and then I think number four also just stands out to me as part of this transportation commission about how can we use this commission to be reviewing projects more often or early. I even feel like in the scoping of projects and making sure that when things go out, the Transportation Commission likes the framework that's being set up and then weighing in as designs are happening along the way. So those are a couple of the items on the list that really stand out to me as ways we can uh, get a lot of action going soon. Thank you, Kate. Kevin? Um, I, I just wanted to observe um, that Yes, uh, design guidelines are important, so are the engineering standards, of course, but we could get bogged down in that process. This is one thing I can tell you about my back, from my background for, in finance, is that, the, is that the grants come up when the grants come up, and, and we have to uh, work fast and hard to uh, make the application and be competitive to uh, actually win a grant. And so, yep, I, I say the design guidelines, engineering standards important, but to also be mindful that when it's time to go after the money, then we have to be nimble then too. And um, and, and I would say, and I can't, couldn't say which is more important, the money or the uh, the standards, but that that's what that's what we're often faced with. Um, and. Uh, yeah, uh, otherwise I would think these these 10 plus the additional one, I love that uh, comment by Susan about an internalization of external costs. Thank you very much for that. Um, Bob, Bob Kuhn. Bob, if, we're, if you are talking, we can't hear you. Uh, sorry. Can you hear me now? I can. You know, we got to look at developing design guidelines for future roads. Sometimes developing design guidelines for roads that are already there and the infrastructures in the properties adjacent to it is unaffordable. But move forward with some of the roads now that we're looking at developing from north to south. You get them in then. Uh, uh, you know, with like Lone Tree and J. Wesley Powell, this is the time to move forward with those in, in that advancement there. Thank you, Bob. 
Um, Jody Norris has a comment. Um, Jody, would you like to share your comment with the group? I call on you. Okay, I will read it then because I can't hear her. Um, if the climate emergency is a real goal, we're going to need to shift from asking how much we can do with the existing budget to asking what changes will it take to achieve our goals and give those honest answers to council and town. And thank you for making the emoji so you could um, get the chat button to work, Jody. <laughs> Oh, and uh, Kate has a clarification here under design guidelines slash engineering standards, etc. I would include a TIA. Um, I was going to call on uh, Denise, um, the staff liaison for um, the Inclusion and Adaptive Living Commission, but I believe Denise left the meeting. Um, just to see if these first 10 things are items that that commission has had a chance to take a look at or if there were comments related to the first 10 things. Okay. Any other comments or, or questions from the group? Uh, Matthew. Hello, I have a uh, one question. Well, uh, one question, a comment. What is TIA is my question and my comment would be. I like number six, the new process for closure and details uh, detours from the fourth street project we had. I really liked the fact that that contractor was able to. He had a auto shutdown, but he kept it open for pedestrian travel and stuff. So I think uh, we should be looking at like incentivizing the contractor to really uh, not ignore that, that fact that when they uh, bid on jobs, they need to plan out pedestrian and bicycle detours. So that's where I'd like to see a stress and then develop design guidelines and standards. One thing I noticed when I was doing construction about 15 years ago, the city used a lot of references to Maricopa County. So if we develop standards, I'd like to really make a more design for our environment up here and the with the winter and everything instead of referencing some Maricopa County standards and stuff. That's that's my comment. And then my question again was what does TIA stand for? Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Um, TIA is a traffic impact analysis. And so that's done with um, new projects or developments um, to look at level of service on roadways and the increase in um, vehicles and what that means for delay. Any other any other questions? All right. Martin, should we move on? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. I'll, I'll, I'll uh, two other two other points on uh, this first part of implementation. Um, for the first ten things, um, there's a little discussion in the in the plan itself about uh, having an annual strategic plan. So these first ten things would, you know, presumably we would start to get some of them done, and then we could reassess where we are and what's the what's the next thing that's important to do. So we could we could have a, a process of of developing an annual strategic plan to identify what the next what our next steps might be what's what's most important for us to to do uh, many years ago when uh, the bike advisory committee was first formed they used to uh, at, at a meeting or two every year come up with their list of, of things they would like to see happen in, in the community for um, for biking so this would be something familiar uh, similar uh, the, the second point was was more generally about implementation and and uh, I think we need to add something in, in the document about this. We, we tend to think of implementation as, as being kind of, um, you know, big steps or, or big picture items or, or building things or, uh, you know, adopting documents and, and things like that. But the reality is that most implementation happens kind of in the day-to-day -day decisions that we make and the, and the things that we do every day. And I, I think there's, um, 
you know, an opportunity and a, a challenge there uh, that that we make sure that all those things that all those little decisions that we make every day are getting us headed in the right direction. Because at the end of the at the end of the day, at the end of the week, at the end of the year, uh, the, the combination of of all those individual decisions adds up to something that that is either moving us forward uh, or not. And and I think we need to be mindful and intentional that that we're aware of those things and of those all those decisions decisions that we're making um, and that they're moving us forward and kind of a general thing but it, it feels like it's it's kind of important uh, so when we talk about implementation of infrastructure there's a couple of different options the biggest one of course is a transportation sales tax um, in addition to the 29 million that's um, available for ped and bike projects uh, there are a number of, of roads that are that are planned with the transportation sales tax, um, which will include bike and ped facilities. So part of it, um, part of what we want to do is, is getting built for us. Uh, private development plays a big role. Um, always, they always have, they always will. Uh, the trick here is that is that because the city is not necessarily in control, we have to make sure that our expectations of private development uh, are clear. Uh, so when they build things for us like foot trails or sidewalks or, or crossings or whatever it is, that they meet our expectations and that, and that they're functional for us and meet all of our standards. Uh, capital projects uh, do the same thing. Uh, the rear to flag flood control could be a potential source of, of good projects. Uh, transit projects are always a good one. For example, the downtown uh, connection center um, could expand bike and fed, fed facilities in that area. Uh, the, the plan lists a number of grants that are available. Uh, those have been kind of um, a little bit scarce, but I, I think we do need to make more of an effort to um, see what's available and, and stretch for some. And then the, the last point is, is pilot programs. So for those things that we're kind of unsure of, of how they might work or what public acceptance might be, or maybe we don't have the money to do it in a, in a, in a large scale way, uh, can we do it in a small scale way? And just, in a way and just see how it how it works and how it functions and, and maybe build uh, public support for it. Nick uh, has just a, few. a question, um, Commissioner Kraft. He, his question is, when does communication take place to let people know about changes that might influence their transportation choices? Uh, well, in this in this case, I, I think um, as part of the public engagement process, uh, but I but I think there are there are some um, larger philosophical issues uh, around transportation that we're not necessarily going to going to tackle or solve uh, as part of this process. So so part of it is is kind of setting up um, future discussions and and how we might how we might have that. And I, I think I think we're gonna we're gonna have increasingly challenging choices moving forward about um, you know what what we're building and and who that serves because we're not going to be able to do um, everything for everybody and all our projects aren't going to be able to serve all things equally well so we're going to have to have some uh, conversations about about how that works and how those choices are made and I think the, I think the secret of that is to have a good process in place. Uh, to do that, and I, I think of of one issue in, in particular that is kind of a, a bugaboo for the community, and that and that's parking. And it's it's would be ideal if we could have enough parking uh, for everybody who wants to park to find something that's convenient. But uh, there, there's a there's a cost to that uh, that that doesn't necessarily services um, in all contexts and in all situations. Um, and that, and that's a difficult community conversation to have and, and I think maybe is, is what you're getting at um, Nick is is that you know we're gonna part of this process is, is learning to uh, make some uh, concessions or live with some sacrifices and and how we get around um, in the interest of having better mobility for everyone and meeting some of our other goals did I get that right Nick Uh, partly, I'm. I mean, I wonder what's appropriate for 
you know, city government to do in. But I also think, um, you know, if there's a trend for less bicycling to happen, it would be wonderful to let people know that, you know, physical things have changed that make biking better. Um, and so um, communication just has to be part of the program. Does that yeah, make sense? Yes, yes, and uh, that's a good and good information too for people. So give people the information they all the information they need to make good choices. Thank you. Dollars. <laughs> Uh, so on the on the sales tax, uh, this was part of Prop 19 approved by the voters in 2018. Uh, it lasts for 20 years, approximately between 2020 and 2040. Uh, $29 million has been identified for pet and bike projects, and this will be generally front loaded. Uh, so it's $2 million for the first seven years, and then $1.1 million, $1 .1 million a year um, after that. And this is, um, for the moment, our primary source of funding for these projects. And, and um, really a good opportunity for us to, to get some stuff done. And I would add, Martin, that um, that funding, um, that does not, I mean, that, that funding separate from a complete streets project. So for example, Lone Tree Overpass will have bicycle and pedestrian facilities as part of that project, but that project there isn't funding that's coming out of that 29 million there for the bike and ped facilities. Yes, yes, that's right. So, so the 29 million is, is really for us to um, uh, to build new uh, needed facilities or to, to fill in missing missing things that aren't aren't part of another project. Right. Thanks. Uh, section seven is outcomes, measures, and targets. Uh, so I think that you, know, you, can, you can read what those are. The outcomes are what we want to see happen. Uh, targets are specific, and I think we looked at them last time, but we have only six of them uh, for mode share, uh, combined walk, bike, transit mode share for all trips, uh, combined mode share for the work commute. The only difference between those two is, is how they're measured. Uh, for all trips, we use the Metro Plan's trip diary survey. Uh, which they've been doing every six years, uh, whereas the work commute we can get from the uh, American Community Survey, and it, it comes out every year, so we have a little bit uh, better access to data. Uh, so we measure both. Uh, we have have set the uh, the goal at um, doubling our mode share. Uh, that's a fairly uh, aggressive goal. It probably outpaces anything that. Um, has been done by some of our peer communities, but uh, there's really two reasons for that. One is, is that uh, our mode share goals are, are going to be linked and related to our climate goals. And so they need, to, by necessity, they, they, sh they should be uh, fairly aggressive. And then uh, I think as, as we move forward, uh, transportation and how we go about it is is changing rapidly. So I, I think there's more opportunities for us in, in the future than, than we might have right now. So it may not be unrealistic to, to be aggressive in, in setting those mode share targets. Uh, for safety, we look at, at pet and bike fatalities and crashes. Uh, for fatalities, we want to have uh, no pet or bike fatalities every year. And for crashes, we want to reduce it by uh, half. And then the last one is in recognition, uh, both the walk, friendly community and the bike friendly community. Uh, Flagstaff is part of. Uh, we are currently bronze for walk and silver for bike. And uh, over the course of 20 years, we'd like to, our, our target is to increase that to gold and then to platinum. Uh, this one is a little bit different in that, in that it's, not, uh, it's not the result of a self-assessment. There's an outside group that, that looks at, at what we're doing and decides what, what level we operate at. Uh, it's fairly comprehensive, and in both cases, the, the programs have made an effort to involve more uh, local people. So, for example, as part of the bike-friendly community, they, they ask you to identify uh, stakeholders and community people. 
and they'll go out and actually interview those people to see how they feel about uh, how, how good walking or biking is in Flagstaff. And then they also do a community survey to get kind of <clears throat> uh, the pulse of <clears throat> the people who are actually walking or biking. Uh, the last section is the planning and design consideration. Uh, like as I mentioned before, this is a this is a fairly long section, and it really is an acknowledgement that walking and biking uh, and the quality of walking and biking don't exist um, all on their own. They are directly directly related to and uh, significantly affected by larger considerations. And I've got them organized into four levels. The, the first one being the uh, how we how what is our approach to transportation planning. Uh, the second one is land use, urban form, and development patterns, uh, which significantly impact, uh, especially walking, but also biking. Uh, the third level is the, is the design and character of our streets. And then the last level is, is what the actual facilities look like. So sidewalks, bike lanes, bikeways, foot trails, um, et cetera. I won't go through these individually, but it, it kind of gives you an idea of, of some of the, the things that are addressed under transportation planning. Uh, under land use and urban form, um, all the information that's in there was really already included in the in the regional plan. Um, we just made it connected to and very specific to how it impacts and and helps or hurts walking and, and biking. Uh, so the information was was developed previously, but uh, since it has an impact on walking and biking, we ma we made that connection and drew that line in in the plan. Uh, streets, we talk about right sizing. So that this is anything from um, how many lanes to how wide those lanes are. Uh, speed management is a tremendous benefit for walking and biking. Um, how we look at intersections, traffic signals, and roundabouts, uh, and, then, and then driveways and how they impact walking and biking. And then the last section is pedestrian and bicycle facilities. And you, can, you can see some of the um, uh, discussion items under that. Uh, last slide, uh, this is a, what we anticipate being the next steps. Um, and, you know, we've kind of, the schedule is sort of broken out month by month. Um, this could move up a little bit. Um, hopefully, you know, it's kind of slipped a little bit over the last couple of months, but hopefully we can uh, keep it on track. Uh, we do need to do an internal review uh, for city staff. Uh, at the conclusion of that, we can go out to a 60-day public review. Uh, toward the end of that, uh, we've got a formal adoption process that works its way through PAC, BAC, uh, this commission, and planning and zoning. And then sometime, hopefully in April, we can be before council for final approval. So it, as part of this, you know, I think that I think that third bullet is really the formal part, but we want to make sure that you have an opportunity uh, to review and discuss you know, the plan as, as, as you see appropriate it at either your, your regular meetings or, or future special meetings. So at, at any time really during that 60 day public review, um, I think it's it's fair to um, schedule discussion before the Transportation Commission. Uh, for pet and, pet and bike committees, we will continue to have it uh, all along. Uh, for the 60 day review period, our intention is to reach out to other commissions as well. Uh, so uh, the Commission on Inclusion and Adaptive Living would would fit into that would fit into that process. Uh, so with, with that, I'll conclude. But if you've got any comments on the, on the schedule or how you'd like to um, interact or engage or be informed or discuss, um, I'd be happy to listen. Thank you, Martin. And I think um, for Transportation Commission, this is something we definitely want to keep on the agenda. Um, this is a great introduction and a flavor <laughs> of, of where we're headed. And, you know, it is a, it's a comprehensive document with a lot of content. Um, so I, w I have a few comments. I, I'll hold on to them, um, but I'd like to open it up to the group, whoever would like to, to comment. And uh, Kevin Parks. Oh gosh. Yeah, sorry. Um had to switch screens to get back to the microphone. Anyway, I wanted to comment, I wanted to say that that even in draft, 
what a remarkable document this is uh, shaped up in the being. Um, really congratulate both of our uh, committees, by bicycles as well as, well as uh, pedestrian advisory committees on all their work. And um, also compliment you, Martin. Um, I mean, just be, besides being a plan, what a what a tremendous um, reference this uh, document has turned into. And I, I sort of wish there was a way that we could electronically dog ear such a document because that's how much I think it's going to get used. Um, not just in uh, Flagstaff, I would expect it's going to get referenced in quite a few communities, uh, smaller cities that are trying to accomplish what we're trying to accomplish. So I want to thank all of you very much. And uh, Kim seconds that and says Martin needs kudos for such hard work. Uh, Brian. Yeah, I just wanted to do the same as uh, comment on how extensive it was and how detailed. Uh, I did read all 49 pages and uh, it was very interesting. I did want to comment on a couple of things. I kind of held my voice until now. Uh, back in the in number four, 405, where you talked about a bike patrol and enforcement and training, I absolutely would stand behind that because when I go down the road and I see bikes running right through stop signs, crossing the road right in front of you without even looking, it makes me nervous. And uh, I know when I ride, I ride with a lot of patience and a lot of care as a motorcyclist and as a bike is biker to pay attention to what the traffic's doing around me. I don't trust that they see me. That was one. And also, I would be very, it, we're back, all, most of my comments were back in number four section. The publishing of the laws uh, so that people understand here in Flagstaff, I think you would find that things would be a lot more accommodating between cars and bikes if everybody was following what the law says. And uh, just on a personal basis, we've got a, I, I've been walking down through the foot trails here in Ponderosa Trails, and I had a biker come at me that I swear he must have been doing about 30, 35 miles an hour down the city cent center of the park and scared the daylights out of me and my dog. And it hasn't been the first time, and it probably won't be the last. If we're going to share the trails, we have to have some etiquette for those trails, and we have to have some teaching along those lines. And um, there is one of the things in the eras in the Flagstaff laws that I personally would like to see changed, and it does have to do with biking, uh, where you can't turn in, you can't pull over into the bike lane to make a right-hand turn. That's against the law, and. I don't know how many times I've gotten ready. I've got my turn signal on. I'm ready to make a right-hand turn. And I look in the mirror, and here comes a biker right on through four cars past to pass me while I'm trying to make that turn. I think that's a problem, child. The other thing I didn't notice was anything in there about FTI as being one of the stakeholders or taking a active interest in what you're doing with the biking and pedestrians. Uh, they do have some interest in what's going on with the foot trails and some of our connective trails and working. How are we doing with that, Martin? Have we done any connection with them or any comments to them? I'm done. Brian, can you tell me, F you said FTI? Yes. I'm not familiar. Like trail initiative. Oh, thank you. OK. <laughs> yeah, yeah, to, Brian, to answer that question specifically, we, we have not engaged with them uh, directly. Um, I think I think, you know, one of one of our intents is to is to make it easier for people to uh, get to trails and other facilities and regional things on the periphery of, of town, uh, whether that's through the foots trails or whether that's um, you know through on the street. 
things. So it, in, in some ways, the easier we make it uh, for walking and biking around town, the, the more likely people will use, uh, you know, start from their house and, and go to facilities that way. Having said that, we did we did look specifically at, at how we connect to regional trails um, in the in the foots part and looking at forest access. So both from foots trails and in, in other locations where uh, people get access to the forest and to regional trails, we're we're trying to to plan and be proactive for where those things happen around the uh, uh, outside of the community. Right. Uh, Kate, you have a comment? comment? Yeah, thank you. I want to echo all the kudos for Martin and also for the PAC and BAC because I know that they've been a big part of this. And uh, overall, you know, the document looks wonderful. I'm so excited to see this come to fruition. Um, and I think, you know, as Brian's pointing out concerns on uh, by the conflicts between bikes and peds and bikes and cars, I think it again just emphasizes the need for this because Ultimately, that's a problem with the infrastructure and the design of the infrastructure, the lack of infrastructure uh, for people to be moving about on the mode of their choice. Um, I'm hoping Martin can candidly answer something for me. So I'm trying to tie together like the um, goals under like section one or um, sorry, let me scan through this. So um, ch chapter four strategies and actions, like I'm looking at the build networks for walking and biking related goals. I'm trying to marry that to the, the section eight, the design. And I'm wondering, Martin, do you think the language is strong enough between those two chapters to really uh, emphasize the quality of the infrastructure that we're trying to get in place? Because I look at some of the items under chapter four and it's just like complete missing sidewalks and uh, you know, along major streets and other important locations, um, plan and implement bikeways. But it, it's not talking about the quality of those facilities within that section. And then under section eight, um, you know, I'm just, I guess I'm just candidly wondering if you feel like the language here is going to make the changes that we're hoping to make under bike and pedestrian infrastructure in town. Uh, yeah, I think, I think, um, you know, we did the inventory of sidewalks doesn't really look at the, the condition or the quality of those sidewalks, just really whether they're in place or not. And that you know, there's a lot of sidewalks that need a lot to be de desired. Um, so it is, I, I think it is kind of a shortcoming of the plan that we don't have anything identified for improving existing sidewalks. Um, like we don't, we don't have, have needs identified or priorities or funding uh, for it. Uh, we really, you know, simply focused on uh, building new sidewalks where they're missing. Uh, where sidewalks get built, we, you know, brand new as, as part of development or as part of streets, I think that's where Chapter 8 really will help. Um, so maybe maybe we need to address that more directly, even if even if we don't have everything identified, that there, you know, there, maybe there's a need to, to look at enhancing existing facilities um, when, when they're subpar. And in some, we, have, we do have some opportunities, like, like when, new, when new development comes in, even if they have an existing sidewalk, um, in a lot of cases, uh, engineering and traffic staff have required them to build a new sidewalk that has a parkway or to add uh, you know, uh, some landscaping on one side of the sidewalk or, or the other to, to make it more functional. Uh, so we probably, that's probably something that needs to get added to the plan. So it sounds like there's, you feel really good about this, the way new sidewalks and bike lanes will be built, but maybe uh, emphasize that a little bit more in the existing. Would that sum up your response there? Yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah, I think like overall my comments are, this is all wonderful. I definitely want to see it move forward. I don't want to delay it with additional changes. Um, and I think I just want it to be very clear on the record or in the notes that, you know, those high quality uh, infrastructure items are what we're striving for. It's not just the connections. So uh, appreciate all your work. Thanks, Martin. Thank you, Kate. I've got a comment from Kevin Parks. Um, more electric bikes are showing up on trails and streets. They're quick and quiet. Um, my guess is that is part of a response back to what we heard from Brian, um, who also says, thanks, Martin. And then um, Kim has a question. Um, 
what is the cost difference between building new sidewalks versus fixing existing? I think that's a, a tough one to to answer, but do, Martin, do you have some thoughts on cost difference between new sidewalks versus fixing existing? I mean, my, my initial reaction is, and, and this is coming from a, a, not as transportation commission, but civil engineer, um, fixing existing, uh, a lot of times it's um, smaller areas, mobilizations involved, there's, um, Sometimes we don't see as much of a difference as we think when we approach those projects. Also, as soon as we touch fixing existing, we're required typically to bring them to code. And um, many times that means it's wider or maybe the grades don't work, you know, making sure that it's an accessible way. Um, Mar Martin, your, your thoughts on those comments? Yeah, I, I think I think you're right. You're right, Julie. Um, like if it were just a matter of fixing, you know, replacing panels, that that could be fairly low cost. Although the the mobilization um, does does uh, cost more for kind of small projects. Uh, a lot of times, like I, I watched when the when the city redid Fox Glen, and they replaced a significant number of panels in the sidewalk itself. And then they replaced pretty much every one of the curb ramps at the corner because none of them met uh, ADA standards or had been damaged or, or for whatever reason. So they ended up replacing a lot of it um, anyway. So I'd, I'd say, you know, it, it does depend on the situation, but it probably gets close to where it, it, it's um, not too big a difference between building a new one versus fixing what's already there. And Brian has a comment that demo is expensive also. All right. A uh, call for more more comments or questions from the group. Can I, well, can I, make, a, can I make a comment? Oh. Um, I just I wanted to acknowledge Estella Hollander and I have been meeting uh, pretty much every two weeks for um, since last spring, and she's done a tremendous amount of work on this plan. She's written sections of it. She's done research. Um, she's been a, a sounding board and a reviewer and a motivator. And I would be um, negligent if I didn't acknowledge uh, how much work she's put into this and how much help she's been in, in getting us this far. So Estella, thank you. Cheers and kudos for Estella. <laughs> thank you. Uh, so I, I did receive a comment from the Commission on Inclusion and Adapted Living, and it was a concern regarding working paper three, mode share trends, et cetera. And it says accommodation for differently abled citizens could be more emphasized in this section of the ATP. In particular, that except when being conveyed by privately owned, or commercially hired motor vehicles, differently abled people are using single or multi-active transportation modes to travel from place to place, noting that connectivity to public transit is already addressed in working paper number three. So I just wanted to make sure that was on, that comment was um, on the record. Is there anyone from um, that commission that would like to speak to that or Kevin, based on your, your previous tenure on that commission. Do you have any comment on that? Um, I actually wrote that comment originally, um, trying to uh, generate some interest from the uh, commission. I believe uh, Commissioner Randall did respond in kind. So that that's really was a was my comment uh, based on my private previous uh, service on the commission. Okay, thank you, Kevin. Um, so my my couple of comments, um, you know, two two really key pieces. That I'm very curious in the public input process. Um, one is those the the guiding principles, pages 16 to um, 18 of the draft, and getting <clears throat> public reaction to those guiding principles because that is those are what's guiding everything in this document. Um, 
And then, of course, on the, the first 10 things on page 71, having public comment input, um, perhaps uh, making sure that that survey hits those those two key things. Um, you know, one thing I, I noted is, uh, you know, you had a, a comment in there. There's some text in there about not doing the bare minimum when it comes to infrastructure improvements. And this is targeted specifically to development. And so my question is, how do we incentivize developers for not doing the bare minimum? So either we're going to change the bare minimum or we're going to have to dangle a carrot. And I don't know what that looks like, but I think that's a conversation we'll need to have moving forward. Um, I think um, so the content in chapter eight is rich and wonderful. When I got to chapter eight, I almost felt like perhaps it needed to be reordered. So just just some food for thought, Martin. And, and as you look at it again, should chapter eight come earlier in the document? And the reason I suggest that is it includes a lot of um, definitions. And it talks about the planning process. Um, and so when I got there, I was like, oh, OK, well, this is what you meant earlier when I read something in chapter three. So maybe there's some content there that um, could go earlier or maybe gets reordered. Um, just just food for thought on that. Um, as I, I think I said earlier when we um, were talking about how this meeting was going to go tonight, um, I think I said that this is I described it as bicycle and pedestrian deliciousness and this is heavy content and it is fantastic and exciting so thank you um i'll do a last call for comments um, or questions and if there aren't any then we can adjourn and i look forward to the next conversation about it so I'll give you just a minute here let me know if you if there are any other comments or questions Uh, Julie, this is Kevin. Yes. Um, r response I have to you regarding uh, developers and and how they might perform above the bare minimum is is uh, it comes as part of public outreach effort is which is to uh, reach out and convince developers that d doing a better job actually sells what they are developing better. Um, and 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 especially when what they develop is then connects to the uh, overall system. So it's really uh, taking their stance that they really are trying to uh, make money at minimal cost, but but uh, expending just a little more can actually sell better. And that's that's what I wanted to say about that. Final call. All right. Martin, any closing comments from you? Uh, nothing, no. I, I, I uh, thank, thanks to the commission and uh, giving us this time to uh, talk about this. Thank you. Jeff, do you have any closing comments? Bauman? Uh, I, I don't have anything to add for this item. I do have, there's more items on the agenda before you adjourn, just to remind okay. you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Lieutenant Higgins, do you have, I saw that you joined us. Thank you. Do you have any comments on this item? All righty. So with that, I will close out the new business item. Old business is none. Concluding general business, we have reports from the BAC and PAC. Is there anything more that you'd like to add to those? <laughs> OK. Um, any informational items to or from commissioners and staff? Alrighty, uh, let's move into item C.
next meeting. Uh, that will Chase, be December 2nd. Kate. Oh, Kate, please go ahead. Sorry, I had an item under the updates to and from. I just wanted to let the commission know that um, we had an open house for the new Caspar intersection uh, last week on the 28th. Um, that's the connection to Route 66 and Caspar out by our headquarters on the east side of town. We had several people attend. Generally, the comments were um, really positive. We'd be happy to bring the design to the commission at any point in time. So thank you. Thank you, Kate. Moving on to item C, next meeting, December 2nd. Jeff, did you have some items there you'd like to discuss? Yeah, I actually, I don't need to go into too much detail, but yeah, I just want to remind you we have a December 2nd meeting, just a couple, three, I guess, four weeks away. You'll be seeing an agenda, maybe it's only three weeks away, you'll see an agenda around Thanksgiving. Um, many of these items you've seen before, Transportation CIP again, Boulder Point, University Avenue, we have um, moved a little bit further along on that process, so we'll have some um, better exhibits to show you. We have a couple of citizen petitions that went to City Council and then were pushed to the Transportation Commission. One is this basis area 50 mile an hour school zone. Struggling a bit with that one because school's not in session, so we haven't been able to watch anything out there or measure anything out on site, so we'll have to think about that when we get to that item. Highway 89 smoke rise traffic signal. There's a request to upgrade that traffic signal. And <laughs> frankly, it's one of the oldest ones in town and needs a lot of work. So I'll go through that with you. Um, Woodland Drive, we met with residents out there late this summer and now have collected data and run through the residential traffic management program worksheets and have some ideas for that. Mount Pleasant, we've collected data. I don't know if we're gonna make it all the way to having ideas to bring forward, but we're gonna try. And then finally, the Sustainability Commission wants to do a presentation about the Climate Emergency Declaration. So, whole bunch of stuff in December. Thank you, Jeff. And then we do wanna keep the ATMP on there as old business. Okay, yep. Make sure we're doing a check-in on the schedule. All right. And with that, do I hear a motion to adjourn? This is Kate, so moved. But this is Bob, seconded. Thank you all. Have a wonderful evening. Really appreciate your time on this exciting topic. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Julie. Night.